All right, so Laura, thank you so much. So good to see you. Hi, isn't it? Great to be with you. Yeah, so I know we've just we've just had a little conversation even before getting started, which has been really, really good just in terms of, I guess, getting the kind of um, vocal cords a bit warm, a bit loose, which is probably helpful. And also I feel just helpful for us just to kind of connect before we press record. The reason why I've invited you on to this call today, as you know, is because I feel that you've got some really good insights which I think will just be really helpful for anybody who's listening or watching and I think that you know you're one of the individuals that, that came to mind straight away in terms of being able to to get you on and just to hear your experience hear about what you do and just to kind of share your insights with those who are watching so I think it'll be really good just for 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 you maybe to to introduce yourself and I'd love for you to do that in the context who, who is Laura who, who is Laura just, who is Laura? Yeah, that who is, is Laura? Question. <laughs> well, what, what pops into my mind immediately is I'm a mother, which has always mm. been central to my sense of identity. And I'm mm. a grandmother now. I've got seven grandchildren. I'm a wife um, and I'm a dog owner. I've got four dogs and I'm a mm. therapist, which mm. has been a major part of my identity, as you know. Mm. Mm. And I've been a therapist since 1996. So we've been around the block for a long time. 1996. Mm. That, that, that's a, that is a long time. I know. That is a long time. And, yeah. and, and, and what, what, what many people would not know, and, and obviously I think, you know, by full, full disclosure, is that back in 2005, I believe it was, when I when I, I I qualified as a counsellor, you were actually um, one of my tutors. I was, and you were yeah. a pleasure, an absolute pleasure to teach. And and the reason the reason I say that one because I think it's just good for people to know that in terms of the context of our conversation, mm. but also, you know, you've mentioned that you know you're a grandmother, you're a dog owner, you're a mother, you're a wife. What you what you didn't mention there was actually. And from my perspective, adding to those things is that you are a phenomenal teacher. Oh, yeah. I love teaching. It's my passion. Yeah. yeah. So I just wanted to kind of throw that in because I know that, you know, even when I was training, you know, the the the, the kind of way you 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 taught, you brought yourself into the space as a teacher. You were you were you were very authentic in that you were very genuine, and I think not just for myself, but I'd say probably for the whole group. And um, my experience of you was one of nurturing, you know, which is why you know when you speak about being a mother and a grandmother and a dog owner, um, I'm a dog owner as well, and I know that requires some nurturing <laughs> and a lot of patience. You know, yeah. I think you you know that was also reflective in your teaching as well. I'm just going to say the thing I left out, which is probably the biggest thing for me, mm. is that I am a woman. And being a woman, of course, has really informed my work. Um, mm. So I'll probably say a bit more about that. But just yeah. I am a woman first and foremost before all yeah. the roles. I am yeah. Laura. Yeah, yeah. Well, say a little bit about that. Say a little bit about being Laura, a woman. What does that mean in terms of it as you embody that? I think even before I was consciously aware of it, I've always been quite a bit of a feminist. And mm. um, I've just got an example of when I was a child and and my mum had not been, a this is a bizarre little story. Mm. My mum had not been able to lift a sack of potatoes from the hallway to the kitchen. And my gran yeah. came around and she picked it up and lifted it. And I was maybe about seven. And I remember thinking, I'm always going to be a strong woman whatever mm. that might mean but mm. in that sense it was physical mm. but how it's informed my work is that I very much first of all I was working on the stillbirth society so I was working with women who'd lost their babies and then gradually through my career I worked in a rape crisis centre for 13 years as their um, clinical lead mm. and sort of had to work a lot with the oppression of women so whilst you know I've got three sons I'm you know I'm I really love the men in my life mm. my whole work is in the background or the backdrop of patriarchy mm. so being a woman is really important to me to empower women to have a voice in a patriarchal society mm, mm, mm. that's powerful that's powerful you've mentioned a little bit about in terms of two specific areas that you worked in how how did you see in a sense that role that work of empowering women within those contexts play out yeah well it, interestingly 
and I perhaps haven't even thought about this in the way I'm now going to speak it, is that mm. when I worked at the Stillbirth Society, women often were going into medical situations and saying there's something wrong with my baby. And mm. medical professionals were saying, you're fine, you're fine, you're just a nervous mm. first-time mother or whatever. Yeah. And they weren't being heard. And And actually, women need to speak out and say... You know, no, you have to listen to me. But when you're vulnerable, that's a really mm. difficult thing to do. Yeah. But then later on, working in the rape crisis centre, obviously the act of sexual violence is one of taking someone's power away. Yeah. And so women come to the rape crisis centre feeling really disempowered. So one of the ways mm. you work with women to gain their power back is to help them think about what choices they can make. Yeah. So I do a lot of training around sexual violence and I, I really support therapists in helping people understand that they have to make a choice every step of the way yeah. because that reconstructs something in them that's been taken away at that time of act, that act of violence. Yeah, yeah. So helping them to get, in a sense, I guess, find and have their voice heard and also realising there is something about choice. And yeah. that, in a sense, helps them to kind of bring come back to a place of feeling empowered. Yeah. So something even as simple mm. as, do you want to tell me about yourself first or do you want me to tell you about the organisation? Wow, Without yeah, yeah, even yeah. knowing, you're enabling them to make a choice. Where would yeah. you like to sit? Yeah. You know, these yeah. are all choices, you know. Yeah, yeah. And if, even, as you, even as you say that, I think, you know, a lot of people listening or watching might not even recognize that just those subtle subtle conscious decisions you are making as a as a therapist or as a practitioner or as a woman engaging mm. with another individual and in this instance you're talking about a woman you know just giving the option of what would you like to hear about first would you like well would you like to hear about the organization or would you like to tell me about you or where would you like to sit just those subtle things <laughs> Most people wouldn't even realise, one, that you're doing that, and, and and secondly, just actually how empowering that might be for them. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It is. And it's like, you know, in terms of like all your boundaries have been broken. So the yeah. therapeutic boundaries are really important with this client mm. group because yeah. you're on an unconscious level helping them have a sense of safety in the world. Mm. So a lot of therapy people think is talking, but it's actually yeah. so much more than the talking. <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah yeah definitely and that's and that's yeah that's that you're speaking I exactly to that that most people wouldn't see that yeah people are thinking it's just a matter of coming into a space um you know ver ver just from verbal diarrhea let it all out and and that's it but you know there is there is so much more going on um in the room that that you know most people don't really realize until you I guess you speak it through with them they're not going to know and I guess why would why would we expect them to know really <laughs> I mean, I guess we don't always tell our clients exactly what our philosophy is or our mm. modus operandi is. Yeah. Um, but it's like, even with the talking, mm. I think you can talk, but you might not engage with your body. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. actually helping clients come into their body and recognise where they're holding trauma and feelings in their body. Mm. So I really like the sensory motor approach to therapy. Because yeah. then it yeah. becomes not just about talking. Okay, so so for people who that's the first time they're hearing about sensory motory, what what does that mean? You've spoken about it's not just about talking, but you're also interested in what what might be going on in an individual's body, you know, where yeah. they might be holding the trauma. Yeah. So say absolutely. a little bit more about that because that that might be really helpful for some people to kind of oh I didn't I didn't think of it like that I've never or or they might even go oh that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's lots of literature out there. So things like um, the body holds the score. Um, I can't think of others I, off the top of my head, yeah. but you will know them. Babette Rothschild, Peter Levine. Uh, so I would say to somebody, because you, if you say, how are you feeling? You immediately take them into an intellectual place. Yeah. Think about what are they feeling? So you've lost the moment. Whereas if somebody's saying something emotional and you say, and what's happening in your body when mm. you're expressing that? Then you've got sensation. And people are less likely to defend against sensation than they are against feeling. So I might say, 
So when you're feeling that pain in your heart, what do you mm. feel your heart wants to communicate to us? Wow, 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 wow. Okay, so you said something there. I want to try and go back. What you? Oh gosh, that was deep. People might not necessarily be in, because they're going intellectually. Yeah. They're not necessarily going to catch what's really going on. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Yeah. Because they've gone intellectual, but their but their but their body might be able to communicate something. Yeah. That they might not have not somehow be in touch with or be able to articulate. Which is why, yeah. like when you said, what what when you felt that in your heart, what might yeah. your heart be wanting to say? Yeah. Absolutely. So, that, so that's almost like at one level, it's almost like separating them from the intellectual, but at the same time, it's also connecting them to something that might help them to become more intellectual about what it is, to be able to yeah. communicate it. Absolutely. Does that make sense? Have I just... Yeah, <laughs> completely. Because yeah. if you think about it, if somebody's experienced some form of body violation, mm. they're going to cut off from their bodies. So you can yeah. often see that people don't breathe effectively. Yeah, yeah. So actually, even if somebody says, you know, I feel really anxious. Okay, so breathe into that anxiety. What's underneath that anxiety? What What do you think that part of you wants to say? Yeah, yeah. It's funny, even as you say that, and, and I know that this is when we had conversations before, I start to feel myself being conscious of my breathing, you know? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and there's times I know I've been with my clients and we're speaking about things and, and there's moments I think, yep, yeah, Nick, actually be mindful of your breathing, actually catching that stuff in your body. What are my shoulders telling me now? Are they kind of like starting to, or am I relaxed? And it's, it's this kind of recognizing that, isn't it? Being aware of yeah. what's, well, I guess the sensations, yeah. but it starts with actually thinking about it, being mindful of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And even like those expressions, like you've got the world on your shoulders. Yeah. Well, yeah. what is that world that you yeah. carry on your shoulders? And often even people's physical ailments can tell mm. you a lot about what might be going on for them emotionally. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. So we've spoken a little bit about, you know, your work, you know, in terms of working with with with, with women who have experienced stillbirth. Um, we've spoken about a little bit about your experience of working with women who have experienced sexual violence and this this whole sense of empowering women through choice and through helping them to both discover and be able to be help them make themselves heard yeah and that's really really important and that that for you is what it part of what in being a woman is as well you know empowering other women to kind of be able to do that which I think is fantastic and I know that there'll be people who are like yeah we're rooting for you Laura we're with you yeah we're with you and and I'm with you <laughs> okay I know um, <laughs> So I had, and and obviously you know I've got you know married got two daughters and you know we've, we've we've had these conversations in part before so but I also know we've spoken a little bit about transcultural relationships transcultural working now obviously you are a white female woman and I am a black male and you and I have known each other for many many years and you know I would say I've had the privilege of working you in a professional capacity now for several years as well you know I, I I believe that part of my growth as a practitioner and as a person okay um and this wouldn't be anything that I've not said to you before is 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 in part um you know down to the contribution that you've made in my life as well um, which I am really really grateful for but but one of the things that we are aware of is our difference, Absolutely. you know, and it's not just our, our 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 gender that we're different and our race. And I'll use the term race. We know socially constructed, but I'll use that term anyway. Um, but but even just in terms of some of our views around our other world views around faith and, you know, and I think that's one of the things that's been really, really valuable. And I've really valued in our relationship because in so many ways, there's so much difference. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Yeah. So do you want to maybe say a little bit about your thoughts around working transculturally, working with people who are different in terms of cultural difference? Yeah, I mean, there's so many cultural differences, aren't yeah. there? But if we yeah. if we think about the social constructed term race, yeah, I think yeah. one of the things that I feel really passionate about is the fact that as a white woman or as a white person, I have a lot mm. of privilege in, in the world. And I know we have talked about this before. 
So when I'm training therapists, I always want to say something to them about, you know, understanding what it means to be white in the therapy room when you're working with someone from the global majority. Yeah. And it surprises me how many training courses don't address cultural cultural diversity in as mm. much as what does it mean to be white. Yeah. And I'm a great believer that we're all racist because we live mm. in a racist society and that as a white person, but as particularly as a white therapist, I've got a responsibility to mm. challenge any racist thoughts that might um, work, be unwelcome but come into my thinking. Yeah. So I often say to therapists, just because you know that you challenge your own racism, and I wouldn't say you're not racist just because you know you're not racist I would say just because you know you challenge your own internalized racism introjected racism you have to calculate in that the person in front of you who's from the global majority may still perceive you as representing racism yeah, yeah. and I think it's really hard for people white people often to get their head around that but to me it feels an absolute given that that yeah. that is what's going to happen how could yeah. it not in the same way yeah. that men represent patriarchy that's why most great crisis centers have women only spaces mm. so mm. for me i feel really passionate about it as a teacher that yeah. we have to and you know if you look into history man i love all theorists i love freud i love Jung. yeah but if you go into their teachings a lot of the things that they said were quite racist in fact right. and I don't think many people really understand that but there's a book um I can't see where it is on my bookshelf but I'll send it through to you yeah, yeah. which which talks about how um psychotherapy and slavery were mm. running parallel through the chronology of time and wow. so we can't underestimate how influencing our our eurocentric training has yep. been and and i really want to address that i know i'm yep. just one small voice in the world but i want to be a voice about yeah. that yeah yeah and uh, and and i i'm i'm with you in the sense that you know it does even now you know and i've 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 speak to other practitioners and there's still a sense of how come this isn't addressed more in in training you know because it's you know obviously things over the last few years have, have shifted you know following the murder of George Floyd and stuff but and there has been a major shift but but there's still a sense of is this something we speak about enough is this something we put out there often enough for people to really start to to to, to kind of challenge themselves but not just challenge themselves to tick a box but to to really see change particularly in the therapeutic space you know yeah. at a relational level I'm, I'm 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 mindful that there will be you know we we could we could kind of talk therapeutically all day long um but i'm but i'm also mindful you know we'll have we'll have people listening and 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 watching that that aren't necessarily from a therapeutic you know they're not coming from that headspace you know these are individuals that you know, that are working day to day in normal kind of, when I say normal, I mean, they're not in a therapeutic space, but they're working in professional contexts. They might have people within their families that that are different to them racially. I like to see black and white as the two bookends. So I, yeah. I just kind of say, you know, and there's everything in between, you know, what, what would you, what would you say to, to those individuals in terms of the benefits, the advantages, the importance of recognizing where they might be in a position of white privilege or some would say now white advantage um there's some debate about what you know and what what i've actually found is that individuals who seem to be less comfortable with the idea of white privilege as a mm. concept as an idea um mm. just from some discussions i've had tend to lean towards the preference of white advantage um, mm. I think there is something around the word privilege which can make people feel uncomfortable. Mm. Um, I'm probably digressing a bit there. Actually, no. Let's let's go there. What? It's an interesting. So, yeah, let's go there. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so for those who 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 might lean more towards white advantage over white privilege because there might be a level of discomfort in that mm. or assumption. Assumptions the the word that normally comes. Oh, there's an assumption that I've had privilege, um, mm. but actually I come from a 
working class background. I have had significant struggle. What, what would you what would you say to to those individuals? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting one, and I mm. I kind of think that of course everyone's had disadvantages in their mm. life. I, I've been disadvantaged as a woman. You know, mm. I would say that you as a man mm. have more privilege than me mm. in terms of patriarchy. I mm. have more privilege than you as a white person because I can go into any place really. Yeah. and not have the energy change against me. Yeah. I think that people underestimate the subtleties of racism. So I know when I was um I was in a long relationship with with a a guy who was from um one of the small islands. Mm. But I know that if we went into say a pub in Kent which is quite mm. a white area, mm. um I would feel the energy change. Yeah. And I yeah. don't think white people unless they you know, unless they've been in a relationship with someone or they go out with people who are of, uh, from the global majority, mm. they won't notice the energy changes. Yeah. Yeah. It's not what's spoken, it's an yeah. energy change. Yeah. And I, I would immediately feel on edge. Yeah. And I would immediately feel protective of, of yeah. my partner at that time. And yeah. and he had to live with that, as I'm sure you do. I totally get it. And I think it's... it's um that sense of energy shifting yeah it's one of those things that i would i would say in my experience as a black man it it feels tangible <laughs> yeah yeah it, you just you just know it in the same way that i've been in context where i'd walk in a room and i'd be the only male in the room mm. you feel it you know yeah. it's like but it but it's it's be- because it's, we're different but i think when it comes to racism or so the, the, the social conditioning that's kind of resulted as that's come as a result of the ideology of racism I think some people are unaware of what that what what might be coming out of them yeah. as exa- and an example you just gave in terms of you going to a pub with with somebody who's 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 not white mm. the energy shifts yeah absolutely and people aren't even aware they're doing it I mean, maybe, but for me, it felt like a hostile shift. It didn't right, feel like okay. a friendly shift. Yeah. So, you know, you can say, well, I'm disadvantaged because I'm I'm working class. Mm. And maybe you've got less privilege than somebody who's middle class. But if you're white working class, you know, you're not going to go places and necessarily people are going to measure what your social class is immediately. Yeah. Whereas true. if you're someone of colour then that's immediate. There is no hiding of that, is there? Mm. You said you felt you felt the hostility immediately, but you also felt protective. Mm. What what did that look like? Um, gosh, I'm going back quite a long time now. It feels like another lifetime ago. I think I I mean I I'll, I'll give you a different example, which okay. I think hides, highlights it better. So mm. I was in B and Q with my partner. Mm. And he asked a question mm. and the shop assistant spoke to me. Oh, and I've so I that. would yeah. I would refuse to answer. I would mm. I would just look at my partner because I would and I, I mean maybe I should have been more courageous and challenged it. Mm. Um but what I would do is sort of like direct the attention back. Yeah. Yeah. So he so he wasn't invisible. Yeah, totally. It's yeah. like being visible and invisible. All yeah, in the yeah, of breath, course. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm aware as we're talking, I feel quite angry still, and I'm mm. quite emotional about yeah. it because yeah. it, it's shocking, and it, you know, it, mm. it's still happening. It's yeah. still happening, and white people are fragile. You know, um, mm. Robin D'Angelo, white yeah. fragility. You yeah. know, I think as a, we're fragile, we don't want to be mm. thought of as racist because we're bad mm. people. But actually, yeah. if we could be more honest about our our lack of understanding, then we could yeah. address it more easily. If we could all communicate like the way you and I communicate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, one conversation at a time, as they say. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And and it would be great to have more conversations. Yeah. Even sort of have a space where people can Mm. come and you know really sort of have that kind of experience of talking about it safely yeah 
yeah and that's and that's and that's where the change comes you know so i know when i've had conversations with people i've i've kind of said that you know through conversation honest and open conversation through vulnerability you know you you develop understanding and through understanding you can develop empathy and that's that's the kind of trajectory that i think we need to be on you know more open conversations more vulnerability learn to understand it's not you know no one has to be defensive you know no one's pointing a finger but it's it's growing to understand one another as as humans you yeah. know and and we we develop empathy and then things can get better you know and i think it becomes much more richer and um and better for everybody you know and that and that's whether that's a teacher and a student a, a therapist and a counselor you know a, an employer and an employee you know it really doesn't matter you know it, it plays out in all of those different spaces yeah and know. microaggressions i think is the term that mm. some of my like friends and colleagues have said you know that there's these constant microaggressions yeah. And yeah. if you think about that as a paper cut, you know, mm. paper cut really Ooh, they're hurt. horrible. Yeah. Get enough of them, they're going to cut your yeah. arm off, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. No, it's, 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 you know, and I know I've experienced that on many occasions, you know, and, you know, you have to, it, there's been times when you have to kind of like turn around and say, well, what, what did you mean by that? <laughs> mm. You know, where's that, where's that coming from? You know, <laughs> you know, but. Okay. Yeah, and it and it and it can. I mean, you you mentioned you know feeling feeling quite you know you can feel the anger connected to it. You know, I know I know for me when I was originally asked to to deliver some training around this whole thing around engaging with race, I remember I was I was hesitant because I remember thinking to myself, I'm going to get mad. I'm going to be angry. <laughs> you know because I know from my own experience it's 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 very emotive you you yeah. can't you can't separate the emo the emotion from it but actually I have engaged in it partly because of what you were saying in terms of from yourself as a teacher it's about helping people to kind of really raise their own awareness and start to really question yeah. some of those internal you know long-held internal beliefs and assumptions that are shaping whether or not they want to see it or are able to see it yet, or want to acknowledge it or not, shape the way they're relating to people who are different to them. You know? Absolutely. And it, and, it, and it really does, you know. No, that's great. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, and I agree. I think it's a conversation that that we could talk more about. Yeah. But I'm mindful. I want to I want to get you to get you to get your thoughts on something else. So there's something else I wanted to touch on. Now, I know that you also you're still a therapist. You, one of the things you said right up front is that you're a therapist. Yeah. yeah. And I also know that you're you're doing a you're 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 also a student. Hey, you didn't say student oh, is yeah. one of your things. <laughs> I'm the oldest student student in the world. <laughs> I would I would I would love for you to maybe share a little bit about the nature of your therapeutic work now, and and I think where it connects to what you are doing as a student. I think that would be yeah. really helpful to hear. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm doing a master's in contemporary psychosexual therapy. So, um, I mean, I was brought up um, in, a, as you know, in a very mm. re repressed sexual environment. Um, mm. I was brought up in a very strict religion. Mm. And maybe at some point we can talk about that because yep. I'm going yep. to be running a group for ex-Jehovah's Witnesses in okay. a few weeks' time. Brilliant. With okay. a colleague of mine. But yes, I'm doing the master's in psychosexual therapy. And what led me there, I think, is, well, A, I really like sex and I'm mm. really interested in sex. Yep. Um, and I had some wild times in my life, which were great fun. Yep. And I think people get too embarrassed talking about sex. Yeah. And so I wanted to do, I mean, I already worked with couples for like about 20 years. I yeah. don't mean they're in therapy with me for 20 yeah. years. I mean, I've been doing the work. Yeah. Over the last 20 years, you've worked with couples. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't worry, everybody. <laughs> um, and so to talk about communication with a couple, mm. communication becomes much more stark when you talk about people's sexual dynamics. Yeah. Um, because often people say, you know, after you've been with someone for a long time, your libido dies down. It's not the same. And it isn't mm. the same, obviously, because mm. you're not mm. in that limerent stage. Mm. But also there is the other thinking that the more you can be intimate with someone, the greater your sexual exploration can be yeah. with someone. 
you know i mean yeah. you know you're an amazing man who's been married for a long long time you mm. know so you you know about this yeah. stuff yeah 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 well, so, I, would, I mean, I would, I would, I would echo that in terms of good communication mm. is expressed in multiple ways. Yeah, that's probably yeah. The, you know how I kind of hear what you're saying. I think, and I think one can't be neglected without the other. Absolutely. You know? And and yeah, I think where where there's good communication, and again, it comes down to to building understanding and trust. You then create a sense of safety where you can be. I guess you can be more explorative as well, and you, Absolutely. you know, and that, and that's and that's the nature of relationships, isn't it? You know, even in just a conversation, the safer we feel in a in a in a, in a verbal dialogue, the 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 broader and wider we can go in the discussion, because Absolutely. there's a there's a level of safety. So, yeah. okay, no, that's cool. Well, I I think I think it's interesting because a lot of people might hear the term, you know sex therapist or psychosexual therapy and they're like whoa what does that mean you know it's all a little bit <laughs> but what 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 does that mean in terms of your day-to-day -day work so you've you know you've worked you said you've worked with couples not the same couples but with couples over the last 20 odd years that's probably thousands of hours of discussions all right yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> you know so so across the span of that, across that time span, you know, what what are the kind of what what typically are people coming to you with as a yeah. psychosexual therapist? Well, quite often it will be the fact that there's a difference in libido. So okay. you know, one will want sex more than the other. Mm. And and what I find going back to this idea of cutting off from the body is yeah. that sometimes there'll be unresolved issues in the in the verbal dynamic. Um, yep. And so the body will say no, essentially. Right. Okay. And so there can be that distancing. One wants it more, the other doesn't. Or it can mm. be things like women might have dyspareunia, mm. um, mm. and that's painful sex or mm. vaginismus where they can't be penetrated. Mm. Um, men might have erectile dysfunction, yeah. um, or premature ejaculation or retarded ejaculation so there's all sorts of things that the body mm. can do that make you feel that you're not functioning effectively right right and and just what you said there going back to what we spoke about earlier in terms of i.e., the body keeping score and the body communicating something so what i'm hearing you say there is these bodily responses or in some cases lack of responses yeah could be a way of communicating something yeah that might not necessarily be communicated verbally. Is that what yeah, you're saying? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you'd always recommend that someone gets a medical just to check there's nothing mm. physical going wrong, but mostly it's going to be emotional and psychological. It's often connected to power dynamics between yep. people. So my job is really to help people explore what their internalized messages are around sex. So, right, for okay. example, if you've been brought up to believe that sex is dirty, that's right. going to have an impact on your relationship with someone. Or if yeah. you've been made redundant at work and you feel powerless, then maybe you're not going to feel potent, you know? Yeah, yeah, so all yeah. of these things. And, and the language we use kind of give quite a lot of clues. Yeah. Mm interesting interesting i mean i think i think it's a it's a it's a it's a broad discussion i think that's probably a conversation we could expand on but i think in the first instance i just wanted to help i guess viewers listeners to to kind of get a sense that working with a psychosexual therapist or speaking about their sexual relationship will likely be connected to other things that's going on it's not just about we're not having good sex it's because yeah. I think because I think that's where people go sometimes when they hear yeah. sex therapists. It's like, oh yeah, we're having issues in bed. Mm. Actually, it's 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 more than that. That's what you're saying. It's a lot more than that. It really is, absolutely. Yeah. But there are also things that you can help couples to do to bring mm. them back into sort of okay um, attunement. Okay. Um, so it, it's a very successful um, course mm. of therapy. Very often, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And I would just make it clear that it's mm. a non-touch thing so yeah, yeah. The therapist doesn't actually have yeah. sex with the client yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> well I'm well I'm glad you said that because again that might be the kind of thing that people are thinking that, that goes on and actually that's not the case that's it not has the case. been asked of me but has no. it <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah and that's that. and that's where and that's where the kind of therapeutic boundaries are just kind of really like mm. <laughs> yeah 
Absolutely. Yeah. Very clear oh, boundaries there. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of time. As I said, there's there's things that we could we could we could we could expand on more, and I'd love to do that. So I'd love us to expand on those maybe on another occasion. What would be really helpful, I think, for those viewing and and listening is to is to get a, get an idea about where they might be able to to find out more about what you do. You know, for example, somebody may be watching or listening and think, actually, that might be what me and my partner need. That might be yeah. something that we should consider. You know, equally, people might have some questions or might be interested in some of your previous work around, you know, sexual violence um, and also your work in the, in the past around stillbirths. Where can people find more information about you and what you're doing? Yeah, so, I mean, I've got a very unusual surname, as we know. So if you Google okay. me, I come up in quite a few places. So okay. I've got a very unattended to professional Facebook page. Yeah, yeah. I've also got a website, which is called The Therapy Space Northern Ireland. And I also do loads of work online or my LinkedIn profile. And you also mentioned that you're going to be, you're, in the near future, you're going to be hoping to run a course. Do you want to say a little bit about that? It's a support group for yeah. um, for people leaving Jehovah's Witness organisation, which is going to be run by myself and a colleague, and we're both ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. So that's one of the things that we're going to be doing. But I also run a lot of courses online and in my um, home in Northern Ireland around mm various aspects of therapy brilliant brilliant so we'll make sure people can get hold of all of that all right just to kind of wrap up unless you've got any anything else if, there, is it, if there's anything because i because i know i i know you well enough laura to know that you you've got some nuggets and they just like you know i'm, I'm often laughing about it so right whenever i speak about it, i'm gonna have to put your surname in brackets with the i'm gonna have to reference it <laughs> reference me yeah yeah anything else that you'd want to just want to say by way before we kind of come to an end today i will just mention the teddy bear in the background in case yeah. anyone's wondering why i've got a teddy bear mm. it's because i work with a lot of clients who've got dissociative identity disorder mm. and so some of their child parts feel grounded when they see the teddy bear in the background um i don't know if i've got any other bits of wisdom to share or you know nuggets because nothing's popping into my head well can i just say thank you so much for just sharing your time i know you've kind of fit this into a, a very busy private practice um so I really do appreciate your time really really value just kind of your openness and what you share today and hopefully you know I look forward to, to to speaking again in this context I know we're going to continue working anyway but but in this context I think it'll be really valuable for those watching and listening so thank you Laura oh it's been lovely thank you for inviting me no you're welcome you're welcome